welcome my merry band of Osatters one and all to this, the 56th episode of the Sockmetician podcast. My name is Nathan Taylor, also known as Sockmetician right here on YouTube, but also on Ravelry, Instagram and Twitter. Welcome one and welcome all. Uh, I might sound a little breathless. There's a very good reason for that. I'm a little bit under the weather. Some of you may know this already because I've been uh, Instagramming live yesterday and I probably didn't sound particularly <laughs> healthy. I've got, it's nothing, nothing serious, I've got a bad cold. Uh, it's on its way out, but it's been with me for a week and a half and I'm just now, I'm gonna say it, full of mucus and uh, full of phlegm and anything else that's kind of gooey and gungy and bright green. <laughs> There, I said it. Um, how have you been? That's, that's much more exciting to talk about. I'd love to know anything that you've been up to. So if you want to share what you've been doing, uh, things knittily or otherwise, then do head over to Ravelry and join the Sockmetician group there. We're a very, very fun and vibrant bunch of people. There's always lots of people chatting and lots of people to chat too. So that's going to be marvellous. Um, it'd be marvellous to have you there. So... Today is uh, Thursday. <laughs> I don't really know where I am. You might notice that the lighting is very, very different. Well, I have, it's dark outside. It's absolutely dark outside. So I've got all the lights on and I've, got my, I've set up some studio lights. It's so strong. Look, there's a light right in front of me that's casting shadows on my face. <laughs> if you could see what I could see right now, it's almost blinding, but it's uh, my way of trying to be able to do this so that it doesn't just get darker and darker throughout. So you should still be able to see some nice bright colours of things. Yes! You see things look nice and bright when, uh, when there's enough light, which is kind of how the eye works and how the brain interprets signals from it, and I'm sure I don't need to talk about that kind of thing for you anyway. Right. It's been a busy time, as always, here at Taylor Till Towers. And uh, Ben is currently in a recording studio in Crouch End, which is kind of somewhere over there. And he is putting the finishing touches on the mixes of the, the cast recording for M, his musical that was performed back in June. Um, you may remember that we went into studio, uh, me and some, some other friends, singy friends, we went and we laid down all the, uh, the choral vocals for it. It's sounding brilliant and it's really interesting Ben's done uh, a fantastic job of orchestrating the show and some of the songs uh, feature it's only a string quartet oh, oh is it it might be a string quintet it might be a double bass as well but it's uh, four or five string players but they sound incredible uh, and it's the type of sound that wasn't uh, available when the show was being performed live. It was much more band-led, but this really pads it out and it just sounds absolutely fantastic. I cannot wait to share some clips and bits and pieces from it with you all, which I will do as soon as it becomes ready. So that's where he is. Um, I have been doing a bit of singing, uh, which is nice. Two weeks ago, two weekends ago, I was performing with my vocal harmony group, Vocally Bespoke, at the Leicester Square Theatre in Leicester Square, right in the heart of London's glittering West End, you know. Um, we had our own show there for, it was only about 90 minutes long, but we, um, it was called The Journey So Far, and the organisers of Oakley Bespoke. For anyone who doesn't know, this is the team that I sang with on the TV show called Pitch Battle earlier in the year, and if you want to look up on YouTube some of that stuff, then look up Pitch Battle Vocally Bespoke and you'll find some of the clips of the things that we did on it. Um, we uh, wanted to we want to raise some money for the group so that we can afford a microphone rig and go out uh, and with better quality equipment than we've got at the moment, so that's why we put the show together. And it was, it was an opportunity for us to be able to tell the story of Vocally Bespoke from its inception with four friends who put it together, me not being one of them, my friends Carrie, Andy, uh, Kylie and Katie. They had the idea, they've been friends for a long time, and how we all joined uh, the, the, the show. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm starting to have a bit of a deja vu. Did I actually talk about this last time? I can't remember when it, when it was. I think maybe I did. Or maybe I said it was coming up. Anyway, um, we were talking about how we all, we, 
in the show, we tell the story of how we all uh, got to got to know each other, and several of us got to know each other through uh, singing at my wedding. So the the various people were in the choir at my wedding. My friend, well, Carrie and I actually we met. We went to the Dominican Republic before that, but she brought Andy along, who's one of the founding members as well. Uh, when we were looking for some singers for our wedding choir, and he came, that, that's how we know each other. And also in our choir was, were Abby and Cleo, and Abby, who was a good knitter, who was sat here on the sofa with me, uh, Abby and Cleo um, uh, are also in Vogue Bespoke and were in the wedding choir too. So it's, it's, it's all kind of avenues lead to people who know each other and can sing, getting together, singing and making nice music. That's basically the plan. The joy of doing the show, in case I'm not repeating myself, which I'm now having worries about, was that uh, because we were telling that story, it meant that we got a chance to to sing Love Is Everyone. And of course, Love Is Everyone is the finale song from our wedding. It's the song that I now have tattooed on my arm here. And, uh, and it was the reason that brought us all together those of us who are who were in both the wedding and the choir we all got together for the first time singing that song and that was that was really very exciting to be able to sing it again um particularly so because the leicester square theater used to be called the venue and the venue is where boy george's musical taboo was first performed in the west end in 96 97 something like that uh, no 98 something like that and it's where ben and i first met in that very room, he was the resident director on the show and I joined the cast and we started rehearsals that day and that's when we met, which was 15 years ago. Uh, so how perfectly circular and synchronistic was it that we managed to sing our wedding song 15 years later in the very room that we first laid eyes on each other all, those, all that time ago. It was very special, it was really, it was really lovely. And Ben wasn't in the show because he's not in Vocally Bespoke, although he was in it originally, but he had to drop out because of other commitments. Um, but he was in the audience, so we were able to... I was able to sing Love Is Everyone to my husband. How exciting is that? That was that. It, it went down really, really well. The theatre holds... Well, I counted. 403 seats. I got bored while we were doing the sound check and I counted the seats. 403, by my reckoning. Uh, and it was pretty much sold out. There may have been 20 or so empty seats, but you really couldn't see them dotted among all the, all the full ones. Uh, and I didn't realise, but my dad and my stepmother, hello to you both, uh, one of you at least watches, um, decided to come and see the show. I hadn't really told people I was doing it in terms of family because it it's a big commitment to come down and see the show and come to London and travel from around the country. I didn't want to put that pressure on anybody. Um, and also I wasn't doing a huge amount in it. So it was just me doing some things with some, some of my friends and singing some nice music. So I didn't expect anyone to come, but uh, Leo and Abby, who are both Facebook friends with my dad, <laughs> came into the dressing room and said, your dad's here. I was like, what? And uh, how do you know? And what? <laughs> he hadn't told me he was coming any more than I told him I was doing it. He says he had. You say you had. But um, he put it on Facebook and I don't look at Facebook. Hardly ever. Hardly at all. If you really want to keep a secret from me, put it on Facebook. <laughs> That's absolutely a guaranteed way of letting everyone know and I won't find out. Planning a surprise party for me? Put it on Facebook. I'll be none the wiser. <laughs> so that was, um, it was lovely to see them and thank you both for coming. And I must tell you, last time I went down to visit my dad in Western Supermare, uh, we went to a little knitting shop. And the reason we went to a little knitting shop was because uh, my stepmother, after 50 years of not uh, knitting, has decided that she wants to take it up again. So we went in there to choose her yarn and some needles, and uh, we did, and she has now knitted. She showed me the photographs, she didn't have it with her, but she showed me the finished cowl, really big. So I, um, she, I don't think she's ever knitted in the round before, I might be wrong on that, but certainly reminded her, if not showed her how to knit in the round, and, uh, and reminded her how to cast on. And she, Muscle memory is a very, very interesting thing. I know that I enjoyed picking up knitting as an adult because I had done it as a child. I think if I'd never done it as a child, I would have struggled with the mechanics and the dexterity of it all. Um, 
Liz says she hasn't knitted a single stitch for 50 years. Well, it came back to her fingers like it was yesterday. She couldn't remember uh, up here what needed to be done, but when I showed her, she was like, oh, oh like that? I was like, yes, yeah, just like that. <laughs> Duck to water springs to mind. So she showed me this photograph, it's fantastic, it really, really long. I bet she could wear it like a full on snood or wrapped around her neck. Lovely. Um, so very soft yarn. It's a, it's a critic yarn, uh, which I know will make a lot of people watching this shudder, but it's very soft and it's exactly what she wanted and it was inexpensive because she wasn't sure she was going to enjoy it after all this time. But I think she might have the bug. My next task, of course, is to introduce her to the world of um, natural fibres, and then there'll be no stopping her. <laughs> Bringing a bit up to date, uh, because otherwise this roundup would just go on forever. I don't want that. Um, I have spent a very, very busy weekend, uh, weekend just gone, uh, teaching classes. And it's been marvellous. I actually, do you know what? Before I even talk about that, um, I've also been doing a lot of rehearsals for a show that I've got coming up next week. I've got two shows, in fact, one, one in Workington and the other in Northwich, I think, next Thursday and Friday, with a company that I've started working for called Broadway and Beyond. You may remember I did one of these shows back in uh, the very early days in June, I think it was, but it seems like so long ago, I'd forgotten everything and I had to, I needed to be re-rehearsed in. But I'm actually doing two different shows back to back. They have two totally different theatre shows that they send out. One is called Broadway and Beyond, the other is called Broadway and Beyond, The Magic Lives On, and it's, it's, it's another version of. And it's big hit songs from hit shows. Oh, hello boys, sorry, did I, did I knock you over? Now, uh, you may have wondered why Stuart's not showing his face to everybody. There you go. Um, are you okay there, Stuart? He's not feeling very well himself, so he's, he's, he's gone into to Aloysius for a, a lovely sort of LGBT bo boyfriend bear cuddle. And uh, don't we all enjoy one of those? Um, so, yeah, we, the show is, is all well-known songs from mostly more traditional types of musical theatre. There's not anything from Les Mis. Um, we are actually doing something from Miss Saigon, but um, it's not, the, it's not the, the, the stuff that you'd expect normally in these kind of shows. It's uh, much more Irving Berlin, Cole Portery. Uh, there's some left field choices as well, which will, it, <coughs> excuse me, uh, which will uh, surprise some of the audience, but it's catered very much towards an audience who like the old fashioned traditional musical theatre. And it's great opportunity for me to be unashamedly showbiz. Da, you know, sort of like, palms out, chest open, playing to the gods. I love it. However, it's a lot of material. It's a lot of material. And I'm not in my twenties anymore and I find it harder to pick stuff up than I used to. And that's starting to worry me. My superpower was always my almost photographic memory, but um, seemingly not anymore, which is a real shame. Anyway, I've been rehearsing that all week, last week, while thick with cold, not really able to sing at all, but able to sort of do the moves and hope my brain would, would pick up some of it. Got a lot of homework to do. That's not till next week. I can worry about that next week. But at the weekend on Saturday, I took another jaunt up to craft days in uh, Saffron Walden, um, where lovely Jane runs a fabulous shop there. and. I taught one of my shaping, colon, the future of double knitting classes, which is the, the, the step on from the beginners class. Now, the interesting thing about this is I want to rebrand it. I've decided um, I'm not going to change the class at all, but I think people might be a little bit intimidated by the fact that I've always said it's the, it's the more advanced class. It's more advanced than the beginners class, which involves you knowing nothing at all about double knitting, and by the end of it, you do. But it's not an advanced class, if that makes sense. It's, the only stipulation is that you need, to have, you need to be able to do double knitting already, just to be, literally be able to create double knitted fabric. And it gives you some more advanced techniques. So it's not that you have to be advanced, it allows you to become more advanced. Does that make sense? So if anyone's uh, worried about that differentiation and about that uh, description in the future, panic not. This class, if you've done any double knitting at all, this class is for you. So, uh, I taught that. I don't often get a chance to do it. Yeah, I think it's the third or fourth time I've ever hosted that class. And it was wonderful. It was seven, eight people. We had eight. I can't remember. We had one. I can't remember if it was nine, 
and one person didn't show us we had eight because she wasn't very well, or if it was eight and we had seven, something like that. Anyway, a nice small class. So I like to keep the class sizes small for that one because it's a bit more brain power working on. I like to be able to give people individual attention. Um, and everyone picked it up really, really well. I genuinely think most people would have slept very well that night. Their brains had been given a really good workout <laughs> that afternoon. <laughs> Uh, I, it's there's a lot of sort of conceptual stuff in this class Con the concepts of increases and decreases and, and how what you know in single face knitting re relates to double knitting um, so I I talk quite a lot but then you're used to that um, so I had a great time doing that it was really really fun to see how people have, when someone's brain just clicks and they go oh I don't understand oh oh it's that you go yes it's that and that's the moment that I love as a teacher of, of knitting techniques. I love, love, love that moment where people really feel that sense of achievement that they've gone, oh, I found that hard and now I can do it. Brilliant, brilliant. We had lots of moments like that, it was fantastic. And then uh, the next day, which was Sunday, I found myself at Wild and Woolly, the shop belonging to the divine Anna Feldman. Uh, if you don't know Wild and Woolly in North East London, it is a wonderful, wonderful little shop. It's a tiny, tiny little shop, but I love it. Now, sadly, a couple of weeks ago, Wild and Woolly was broken into. The little bar stewards um, broke through one of the, the, the large windows, which had all been painted with a beautiful, anyway, broken and shattered, and managed to get away with, I think, some some valuable things I think, um, which was just so upsetting for Anna. She's um, she's worked so hard to build that shop up, but she's indomitable and she absolutely, the shop was up and running very quickly. They had a proper outpouring of love and support from the knitting community, which I know has has meant the world to Anna. Um, and now you'd never know. Uh, it's I think she's probably a little bit more cautious and a little bit more wary of the world at large, a little bit less trusting of people, which is always a shame. Um, when someone loses that, the ability to, to sort of have that kind of faith in their human, in humankind, it's a shame. However, it's the world we live in and uh, we have to adapt to it, don't we? All too often, it seems. But that was a wonderful class as well. And uh, I, Larissa was there. Larissa, who you'll all know as the dyer behind Travel Knitter, who dyed the yarn with which I made the Il Barato scarf. And she actually had my scarf with me to return it to me. And I said, why don't you hang on to it? Because she's, she's got a couple of shows coming up where she's hoping to sell some more kits. Um, so I said, if that's going to help you sell more kits and make some more money, then keep hold of the scarf. So I still don't have it. <laughs> it's on a semi-permanent loan to Larissa. Basically, as long as Larissa wants to keep um, putting out kits for sale for it in the four colourways that we've done, then, uh, then I'm happy to, very, very happy for her to hang on to the scarf. Listen, it ain't like I don't have scarves to wear. <laughs> I've got hundreds. <laughs> I can't stop knitting that when I keep making more and more and more. Anyway, that kind of brings us up to this week. I've had, uh, it just feels like I haven't done a great deal more this week because I've just been sort of full of congestion and trying to shift all that. But I'm trying to rest up as much as I can and uh, while sitting and doing some knitting. Most of the knitting I'm doing, however, about which more in a moment, is stuff I can't show you. And that makes me feel like a very bad podcaster indeed. So uh, later on we'll be talking about the current whips that I've got on the go that I can show you, but I might sort of dip into the archives a little bit as well. So let's move head on, shall we, straight over to um, the community section. Before we even get onto podcast questions, actually, um, I was delighted to see that Lorena, who is Miss Rena on uh, Ravelry and the owner of Piggy Yarns, the, you'll remember Lorena gave me the the Pride Rainbow yarn and the Bear Pride rain, uh, the Bear Pride flag colorway self striping socks, uh, sock yarn, diet. Um, Fabulous, fabulous. Now, she had lots and lots of calls for that, and people have wanted that to be a, a repeatable colourway. So she's, she's done it, and she's, she's listed it for sale, and I know they're selling like absolute hot cakes. So if you want to be in with a chance, if you want to contact uh, Lorena, it, it looks like this. I mean, it's really, really lovely stuff. It is 
the colours of the Bear Pride flag. Now, uh, then, then head over, finish that sentence, Nathan, before you move on to the next one, uh, then head over to piggyyarns.etsy.com and, uh, and I'm sure she hasn't got any currently in stock. I'm sure there'll be some soon. I think it's going to turn out to be a very, very popular colourway. Sorry, Lorena, I think you may be ending up spending a lot of your time dyeing Bear Pride yarn. You are the source, and it's brilliant. Now, interestingly, I've been talking about this yarn on Instagram, because I, I have a, a scale of it myself, and I haven't started it yet, but it's one of my needle-adjacent things. I'm going to be working on it very soon, I think. Um, a lot of, I've been talking about the fact that it's the colours of the Bear Pride flag and what that signifies, and people have... It's really been interesting to see people's different responses to it. A lot of people have said, well, I don't know what all the fuss is about, um, they're just nice colours. It's like, well, yes, yes, they absolutely are nice colours and no one at all is suggesting that in order to enjoy that yarn and that uh, scale of colours that you have to identify as a member of the gay bear pride uh, community. It's not the case at all. Um, but I think it's really interesting that through me doing it, a lot of people who are completely unaware of the concept of the subcultures within the, the, the gay community, as in the gay male community, as part of the umbrella of the LGBT community, um, people weren't aware that those, those delineations existed and that people will identify as different subtypes of, of gay man. And I think it's been brilliant that that's that's educating people and, and spreading that message and people, making people go, oh, I, you know, I, I had no idea. That's really, really interesting. I'm, I'm glad I now know that. Now when I see that flag, I'll know what it means. Because you often do see the Bear Pride flag flying outside certain uh, bars um, in various cities around the world. So it's, it's a useful thing to, to know what it means. It's also, it's about community. So many things in life, aren't they, are about finding your community. Look at us here. We found that I, I can belong to many different communities. I can belong to the gay community. I can belong to the theatre community. I can belong to the, uh, the knitting community. I can belong to the double knitting community. I can... The, the, all of these things, we find where we fit. We find our tribe, don't we? Um, and I think the knitting community is a particularly strong one. Um, and I love the fact that in my world, various different types of my community will cross over. So through Lorena, who is not a gay man. <laughs> you know, are you, Marina? <laughs> she's very definitely not a gay man. Um, she's been able to facilitate me talking about this, which will hopefully speak to members of the knitting community who also associate with the, the bear community and, uh, and bring those things together. And using Lorena's fabulous yarn can express themselves in the bear community in a way which is appropriate and visible and relevant to to those people, which is just amazing. I'm kind of burbling, but I think you you know what I you know what I mean by that. I love the fact that we can all help each other out in lots and lots of different ways. That's essentially what I'm talking about. Um, so that's that. Now there are a few podcast questions in the podcast questions thread. If you do have any questions for me that you want me to answer uh, via the medium of me chatting to my iPhone, then then head over to the group on Ravelry and go to the podcast questions thread. Um, please no chatter on the thread, just leave it, leave it for me to answer any of the questions that are in there, or if you know a quick and dirty answer to the question, take earburn someone in the general chatter thread, it makes my life a lot easier going through. But we do have a few here. Um, let's have a little look and scroll back to find out the last one that I answered. Here we go. So, uh, this is uh, Lutten78, who is from Norway, says, Hi Nathan, thanks for doing the podcast, just found you, and I love it. Well, I love having you here as well. Welcome. Delighted to have you as part of the group. You might already have answered this in a previous episode. Wait for it, everybody else. I jest. Um, but, I love your tattoos, and wonder if you have any knitting or yarny tattoos, and will you give us a tour of your left arm? Hugs from Norway. Well... Uh, Lutton, I'm, I'm delighted to be able to tell you that I do have a segment of this uh, podcast, which I am not doing today, I haven't done for a little while, but it's called What's Tat? And uh, if, if you start catching up on previous episodes, I do talk about one of the tattoos on my arm in every episode of it. So you've got all that to come. In terms of Yarny tattoos, no, I don't. I came close. A different incarnation of what's on this arm 
was going to be somewhere else and was going to include some sort of knitting stuff, but I decided to uh, specify more what I wanted this one to be about. And so uh, knitting for another time, perhaps. I'm not, I'm not going to say never. It's a big part of my life. And I do tattoo large parts of my life onto my skin. So you never know. Ozeis, Ozis, I don't know, says, Hi, Nathan. Lisa. Hi, Nathan. I'm not a tats girl, but your music tat is absolutely stunning. Thank you very much. My question doesn't relate to tats is, I've been admiring your cushions, which look knitted. If so, are there another of your designs pattern available anywhere? Thanks and regards, Lisa. Well, yes, they are, and yes, they are. Um, they are. Uh, do you mind if I just move the boys a second? Excuse me, lads. I know, Stuart, I know, you look a bit poorly. Let's just put you both down there. They are a pattern called Reunion, uh, and they are the two sides of, two halves of the Union flag, which is the flag of uh, the United Kingdom, and it's hard to see in this light. There you can see the the lines of them there. If you put the two halves together, you get the whole flag. All done with texture work. It's a kind of DK. Is it DK or Aaron? I forget which. It's the Donegal tweed. Um, and on the back, they look like this. You've got the uh, wooden buttons there that I've put on them. Uh, they're knitted absolutely seamlessly in one piece. Well, two pieces. <laughs> one each, but one piece. They're started with a cast on at the bottom. A bit of foam popping out of my... There's a hole in the leather of the sofa. Foam comes out, I hate it, it's everywhere. It's on all of my hand-knit socks. Um, they're knitted, um, they start with a Judy Becker's Magic cast on and then they're worked in the round, like a great big toe, a great big sock. And then you sort of, when you get to this point here, you do some interesting shenanigans, which are all explained in the pattern, where you cast some stitches off and work around the back and then cast more on as a provisional cast on and then continue and then graft across the top. And then you go back and you knit the button band going back from the provisional cast on going the other way, knitting it into the sides as you go. So you get this overlapping envelope flap here that's where you're not gonna get any cushion showing through. It's my own construction. I was very, very pleased with it when I worked out how to do it. And uh, reunion, because they're two halves and you put them together and they are reunified. Hey, hey, hey. Reunion, union flag. Did you get it? <laughs> it's based on a pair of socks that I designed for Knit Now magazine a few years ago, which had the same design, half of the flag on each foot. So there we are. And yes, it's available on my Ravelry store. Very reasonably priced. Sorry, here come the boys. You okay there, Stuart? You, you keep yourself wrapped up and go for another nice little hug. A bear hug, if you will. <laughs> uh, so thank you for that question. Now, moving on. Um, it says here... Mrs. Comet Hunter, who is Alyssa, says, Hi, Nathan. Love the Rhinebeck podcast. Thank you very much. Your new tattoo is stunning. Thank you very much. You talked about the music and the colours. Can you tell us the significance of the numbers splashed within the colours? Well, there are numbers in my tattoo. I'll show you here. There's a number down here. There's another one here you probably can't see in this light. There's another one here and I've also got some letters there. Now, I am, I am absolutely going to tell you about them, but not today, if you don't mind. Um, it's, I wanted to answer the question, but it's something I'm going to be talking about in, in a few weeks' time. I've got a plan to do it, a very, a very specific tie-in with something else. So that is, um, you, you're going to have to hold on, I'm afraid, and I'll tell you all about that um, later. It'll be this side of Christmas, but that's, that's the plan. So I, I, I do have a plan to, to reveal all, but it's a conversation for another time. Uh, and she also says something else which I'm going to circle back to in a minute. So I'm going to finish with the rest of the questions first. And I'll come back to the second half of your question, if you don't mind. Um, Hales B says, hello, Nathan. I love your podcast and seeing all of your knitting. That's very kind of you to say so. I'm wondering if you have any gift knitting suggestions for men who aren't knitters, of course. No, of course. <laughs> they should be. Why not? Um, I like to knit gifts for my family for the holidays, but I always struggle to find patterns or items for the men in my life. My dad and my grandpa, in particular, are difficult to choose knits for. Do you have any patterns or general gift knit options for men? Thanks so much. Well, you kind of come to the right place. Uh, and recently released, this, the Dragged Across America hat. I absolutely love it, and I think it's very, very, it's perfect for, uh, for male wearers. 
uh, perfect for male knitters too, but perfect for male wearers. It's a very, very easy knit to make. It requires no great big special skills. Um, there's one tiny little stitch in there that you may not have come across before, but it's all explained. It's called Dragged Across America. Uh, as you can see, it's got this sort of large leaf design on both sides and this very, very chunky lace pattern. So it's really, really warm but it's also really breathable. It doesn't, your head doesn't need to get, um, ah, that's where I joined the cast on, let's turn that round. <laughs> that's ugly. Um, so uh, you don't need to worry about not being able to breathe. You can, it, it lets air through, but it's still really, really toasty and warm. This is knitted with the Quince and Co Puffin. Um, excuse me, it's a chunky weight yarn. And I absolutely love the texture that this produces. It's, re it's lace, but it ain't girly. It's, it's really textural and sculptural, and I, I, I just adore that. And that's what it looks like at the crown. Oh, yeah, all the lines coming together. Some of that was by design, and some of that was pure serendipity, as knitting often is. <laughs> ain't gonna lie. So I love wearing this hat. You can wear it with the leaves at the front as well, if you wish, and it looks, it looks just as stylish. Um, yeah, absolutely. Knitted in chunky, it's about 67, maybe 70 grams of chunky weight yarn in this hat. It's, uh, it's ideal for Christmas gift knitting because it'll be off the needles in a heartbeat. You can do this in a couple of afternoons. There is, um, some of you will have seen this already, but I've also got here the two color version of the hat, which this one's slightly larger because um, I knitted it on slightly larger needles, so I cuff up the brim. It's exactly the same pattern in every respect, but the leaves are rendered in stranded to colour work. But it's in the round, Nathan. How is, how is that possible? Because like the colour doesn't go all the way around at all. Some of you have seen this already, so I'm preaching to the choir here. But on the inside, this is the stranded section of the leaf design, but all of the yarn is just encapsulated there. It's uh, a technique that I developed myself, which I call strantasia, because it's like a cross between, oh, gross, Nathan, gross. Believe me, much more gross for me to experience than for you to, to listen to. Um, it's called strantasia because it's a cross between stranded and intarsia. Now, of course, we all know that you can't really, you can't successfully or accurately do intarsia in the round, but you can do strantasia in the round. In fact, you can only do strantasia in the round. That's exactly what it's for. So if you're looking for uh, a method of, of having a, a patch of stranded colour work on one part only of a circular item, then this is the way forward. I haven't yet written up this pattern, but it is coming soon, um, hopefully in the next couple of weeks. So, Try and get it done by the end of this month, so it will be perfect for Christmas knits. And again, it's knitted in. There's an end to pop it out. The best wood in the world. All your ends will always find their way through, won't they? Um, uh, it's again, it knits up very, very quickly. I've done this in in a day. I've knitted this in a day. I've knitted this several times of different sizes because I wanted to get the the technique exactly right and write everything down properly. But that's what it looks like. It's actually exactly the same uh, pattern but it looks entirely different rendered in two colours. It looks like two very, very different hats. Dragged Across America. This one, do you know what? I am gonna tell people what this one's gonna be called now. I was gonna wait. This one is called Dragged Across Aquitaine. Aquitaine being the region in France. There's a very, very good reason why this is called Dragged Across Aquitaine, which I'm not gonna tell you right now. There's one person, there's one person who I know will be watching this episode who will know exactly why I've called it Dragged Across Aquitaine. And uh, until I find out from her that she has heard this message, I'm gonna keep the reason to myself. But there we are, Dragged Across Aquitaine and Dragged Across America. Perfect guy knits and perfect Christmas gift knits. That sounds like a massive plug. Well, I'm shameless. My podcast, my rules. I don't care. <laughs> um, yeah, one of them is available now. The other one will be available soon. So, uh, Caron Z or Caro NZ, I'm not quite sure which. Oh, Caro in New Zealand. So, uh, brain working, thanks. 
Hi Nathan, or anyone else who can help. Over the past few weeks, I have binge-watched all of your podcasts up to number 53. Good Lord. That's a lot of Nathan in a very short space of time. There's, there are people out there that have quite much, much lower tolerances of Nathan, and uh, it's well done. Um, just wondering, though, is there a USA holiday podcast? If so, where can I find it? There's not yet. There really isn't. Putting it together has been a massive job, and I've had so much else on over the last few weeks. I'm hoping at the end of next week, when I get through these shows, my life will calm down substantially on the run-up to Christmas, and I will have time to just sort of settle and do all of those things. I've also got some problems with storage on my computer. Uh, I don't really have enough room on it, and there's so much of it that the files are massive, so every time I try to open up iMovie to work on it, uh, it just uses up all the capacity. It's extraordinarily loud. I sit here all day, every day, on the sofa that's just over there, and I don't notice those sirens at all. Now that it's been brought to my attention that, that the sirens are a regular feature of this podcast, I notice them very, very strongly. Arminty says, Hello, Nathan. Love the new tattoo. Thank you. It's getting a lot of tat love. I'm curious if you have ever needed any touch-up work done on your tattoos. Curious, because if this one needs touching up, you can't easily return to the artist in New York to get it done. Also, every artist I have had work done by won't do single colour tattoos without a black outline, because they say the black kind of holds in the other colours. Have any of yours spread out compared to when they were first done? I have had to get most of mine touched up uh, one, once the scabs come off. Lots of things there to discuss, Arminty. Um, interestingly, I had one... Very, very reputable tattoo artist establishment, tattoo establishment in London, refused to do this tattoo because they said without any black lines uh, on the tattoo that the colours wouldn't show up against the skin. <laughs> Not so much. Um, I do know that the, the consistency of coloured ink is very different from the consistency of black ink. And uh, well, certainly the, most of the, in most of my experience, and the the black the coloured inks tend to be a lot thicker. In fact, the the purple on this one was so thick the guy was having real real trouble um, working with it on its own. Um, however, there are many many tattoos out there that don't have um, black outlines. I think. I think he needs to kind of update his knowledge. I think that's kind of going back to the whole old school uh, style and the Sailor Jerry style of tattooing, which is maybe the reasons why that style evolved in the first place, to have the heavy black outlines. I don't know. Um, or maybe it's just that it was easier to get a clean, what looked like a cleaner line with the black because of the contrast being so high between that and skin colour. Caucasian skin colour, at any rate. I don't know. Um, I've never had a problem with it. Um, yeah, I've got a little bit of blowout on a couple of the tattoos uh, on my arm. And for anyone who doesn't know what blowout is, it's sometimes where the colour doesn't stay where it was put by the artist's needle. It can sometimes spread a bit under the skin. Um, but that's, that can happen due to the texture of your skin and the thinness of your skin at, at any given point. You can see the N here. You might not be able to see, actually. Um, around here the, the green has sort of it's bloomed a bit to use knitter, knitter technology terminology sorry um not not to a huge level a little bit on the h there as well but that's not ha something that's happened over time that's something that happened straight away and is just an unavoidable fact of, of some tattoos and some locations and the skin here is very very thin there's not a great deal of it so um it's just one of those things um so I think your tattoo artist is wrong because there's, there's lots of examples of coloured styles that don't require a uh, black outline around them. And watercolour tattoos these days are a massive, massive um, trend. And there are experts in watercolour tattoos. Um, Miko herself doesn't profess to be an expert in watercolour tattoos. She, she does a pretty good job. Um, but there are some that look even more like the faded blotches of watercolour and the different hues and, and tones in one colour, which I don't have a great deal of in this tattoo. It tends to be one colour and then another colour and then another and then another. So uh, much as I love this tattoo, the watercolour aspects of it, 
weren't that important to me. What was more important was that the, I got the colour and the vibrancy there. If I'd really wanted watercolour, I could have gone to a different type of artist, but um, they're a thing, you know, and they don't have black outlines, so I, I don't see that being a problem. In terms of touch-ups, no. Um, oh, that's not quite true. Some of the work on this arm did need to be touched up. I had it done in two sessions, and uh, I didn't go back to the first artist for the second session. And the second artist did a little bit of touching up on a couple of them. There were a couple where I had got some really bad scabbing and some of the colour had come out um, as those scabs healed, um, which you, can, you might be able to see in the purple of the bee there. You can see right in the centre of it, in the middle, there's almost like a flesh-coloured bee there. And that's, again, that's down to the fact that the, the purple ink was so thick and you really had to work it into the skin to get, to get it in there. Um, and that extra working of a, the same area caused scabbing. Um, and I had that in a couple of areas, um, particularly this, this area as well, because it gets a lot of creasing, a lot of use. So the, uh, the, as my arm was in use, as the tattoo was healing, that brought out some of the colour as well. So the, the second artist went over that one. He actually didn't go over that one, but he tidied up some of the green lines as well. So some of that was because of scabbing. Some of it was to do with the first artist not necessarily doing a fabulous job, shall we say. Um, the big touch-up that I've had done is I had a tattoo covered up on my back. Um, now, it wasn't that it needed a touch-up as such. It was very pale colours, and over time, they just faded. So uh, I'd had the tattoo there for about 14 years, and it just faded away. So, uh, so I had it covered up with something much bolder and much stronger. I haven't spoken about that one yet. I will do it at a later date, which is why I'm being a little bit cagey about it. So in those... Is there anything else you want to talk about? Um, so they haven't... Yeah, so obviously I can't go back to flushing the drop for hat. Thankfully, I don't think anything on here needs re really touching up. Uh, it's still healing. Um, it still doesn't look entirely... The skin doesn't look entirely smooth. Some of it looks, looks brand new, <laughs> like brand new shiny skin. Um, and in some areas more so than others as those areas heal. And it's again, it's the areas that scabbed a bit more. Uh, some of it didn't scab at all. And the only thing that came out was the sort of the... Um, the excess ink and the lymph, and once that, after a few days, once that washed away, I had perfect, unblemished tattoo skin underneath. There are some parts of it that are still in their healing process, so it's been three weeks and a day, so it's still, it's still early days. It's, it's looking more and more beautiful every day, and I love it. I love it. I love the colours. I love everything it stands for. I mean, it is just absolutely gorgeous. <sighs> yeah, looking at it at the moment, in this light, from the angle I can see as the light from over there is hitting the skin, I can see some of the, the note heads, the black note heads, the circles there, they are shiny. So there was even more work had to go into that than just the line, which was only passed through once. The line work didn't hurt at all, it's the colour work that, that caused all the problems. <laughs> I hope that answers your question. Life Poke. Hello, Henry. Hi. Life Poke is uh, Henderson, who was in my class at Rhinebeck. Says, maybe this has been asked before, but what program or programs do you use to type up your patterns? I'm particularly interested in how you do your charts. Nothing special at all, Henry. I, um, I use, I type them on pages. I'm a Mac user, so I use pages, but Word would do just as well if you're a, a Microsoft user. And I do my charts on Numbers, which is Mac's version of Excel. It's just a spreadsheet program. I have a, a, a font called Knitting Symbols font, which you can... I'm sure there are other versions if, out there if you can't find the particular one I used. I literally, it's a free, downloadable, installable font, um, which has a variety of symbols, so I know what symbols I want to use for which types of stitch, and I put them into an Excel chart. I've made the Excel chart with the ratio of stitches and for double knitting, stitches tend to be sort of like five to four or seven to five, something like that. Um, knitter's mileage may vary, but it's, uh, it's very easily done. It's very low tech. And then I just put those, I put the chart files into the, um, the pages files at the end of the process. I'd love to say it was something more special than that, but I'm a very low tech kind of guy. That's all. 
Now, part owl, part man is David. And David says, hi, Nathan, slowly catching up on your old pods and watching your new releases. Mm, you've been jumping backwards and forwards. I don't know what the beard must be doing. Um, don't think this has been asked before and wanted to hear your opinion. I've recently started getting some nicer yarns, as we all do, and bought myself a ball winder so I don't need to wind my yarns in the store or ask it pre-wound pre when buying online. Doesn't it make life a lot easier? Um, do you have any advice on when to wind yarn? If I wind it loosely, can I wind it as soon as I get it? Or should I wait until just before knitting with it? I'm sometimes a bit too eager to do something with my new pretty yarn, so winding can help keep my itchy fingers at bay. I totally, totally understand that. Thanks again for all the awesome podcasts. Thank you. And for being an awesome role model for guys who knit. You are most, most welcome, and I'm delighted to have you in the group. Um, <coughs> I te- well, I don't pre-wind my balls. I'll, I'll do it just before I'm about... If I, literally, as I'm about to cast on, I'll grab them, set up the skein and the ball winder, and off I go. Um, there's lots of people will tell you that you shouldn't because it can stretch the yarn. Sometimes pre-stretched yarn might be useful. It can stop any un- unwanted mishaps happening later on down the line. If, you, if the weight of a garment suddenly starts to stretch, if it's already been pre-stretched before it gets knitted, I'm not the expert in this, I'm, I'm freewheeling here, but I think perhaps that might stop that from being a problem. However, I'm sure it won't make a massive amount of difference. People say, oh no, you must definitely not do this, or you must definitely do it this way. So many things in knitting, you think, okay, that's a, a way of doing it. I'm sure you'll be fine. Do you want to wind your yarn? You wind your yarn. The good thing about doing it on a ball winder is because they have quite a fat spindle, very often, um, once, as long as you're not putting it under tension as you're winding, as long as it's going through the machine nice and uh, smoothly and freely, once you take it off that spindle, you'll see the cake goes and it closes up the hole, and that, hopefully, will stop it from adding any stretch to the yarn. There will be purists who are going to say, Nathan, don't give this bad advice. Honestly, don't write it in. I'm sure there's reasons why some people prefer, with certain different fibres maybe, If it makes you happy, why do we own yarn? Why do we knit? Because it makes us happy, right? If winding your yarn as soon as you've bought it makes you happy, if you want to admire it in a cake rather than in a skein, and be advised, sometimes it looks nicer in the skein than it does in the cake, so you might want to keep it in the skein to admire it in all its colourful glory. I don't know. But it's entirely up to you. It's your yarn. It's your life. Don't listen. There's no knitting police. Don't listen to them. Don't write in if you disagree with me, I don't care. (laughs) Sarah Jo says, Greetings Nathan, two totally unrelated questions. In your opinion, what is the ideal sock yarn in regards to fibre content? Ooh. Uh, Does Ben have any tattoos? Well, I'll answer number two first. No, he doesn't. I mean, he has no intention of getting any either. He doesn't particularly like them. He likes mine, on me. He has no intention of getting any for himself. Um... Now, sock yarn in in regards to fibre content, well, get some nylon in there. 20% 20 or even 25%. You know, it's all lovely to be able to work with the natural fibres. We know this. But you want your socks to last. After all, you're putting quite a lot of time and effort into knitting them, so you want it to be something that's going to stick around, right? Am I right? All chorus with me together. We want our hand-knit socks to last. After me... We want our hand-knit socks to last, so get some nylon in there. As to what other content you like, well, for me, I'm really, really, really liking yarn at the moment, which is 80-20 BFL and nylon, even more so than merino nylon. Don't get me wrong, I love a merino merino blend, and I love a MCN, merino cashmere nylon blend. Um, Some of my favourite socks are knitted with that, however... I really like BFL. It's a sturdy, workhorse yarn. It's still soft, but it's got this wonderful iridescent sheen to it. It takes light, almost like a silkiness to it. Um, it doesn't feel silky. It feels bouncier than that. It's got a real spring of crispness to it, which I love. It's, got a, it's great for stitch definition, particularly if it's a nice high twist. And with the nylon, it's stronger than merino anyway, but with the nylon, it's going to be, it's going to be around for years. And that's what you want. We want our hand-knit socks to last. Hashtag, we want our hand-knit socks to last. Um, so I would probably say at the moment, 80-20 BFL nylon. Done. And finally, 
Uh, hello, Nathan, says Timoria. Oh, no, that's your rather name. Innes says, uh, I only found your podcast three days ago and watched the last eight or nine episodes. <sighs> I, am, I am so sorry. I can only apologise. You sometimes reference different languages. Welt comes to mind, as German is my native language. So here's my question. What foreign languages do you speak and how well? <laughs> If you talked about it in an earlier episode, please forgive my ignorance. I hope to catch up on most of them in the near future. Thank you so much for your podcast, Innes from Germany. Well, Innes, uh, the only language apart from English that I have any real knowledge of at all, of at all is German. And my German is not very good. Um, I learned German at school and I've worked in Germany. Um, and I like the German language, so I enjoy learning it. But I don't use it often enough to be able to to keep it current enough and the level that I got to in German anyway was very functional it wasn't it wasn't conversational German it, it was asking directions and being in a restaurant or a shop and doing things that an English person in Germany might need to do um, but I couldn't sit down and have a chat with somebody interestingly I was on the tube the other night um, and there were some people talking in German and I was able to pick up the gist of what they were saying quite easily um, but I think a lot of that is down to context rather than knowledge of the vocabulary. I knew the odd word here and there and I was able to piece it together. So I wouldn't, I, I, I wouldn't say I'm a German speaker. I have a little bit of German, but not a great deal. Not as much as I would like. And if life were any less busy or any less crazy, then it would be, German would be the, absolutely would be the language I would choose to learn. The other language I really, really want to learn is um, sign language. Uh, I've always wanted to be able to sign. I know the finger spelling alphabet, but I, I, I know the odd, the odd swear word in, in BSL, but I'd love to be able to sign. Um, I've always had problems with my ears, and I've always felt that there's a chance that one day I, I might go deaf. I don't, think that's, I don't think that's actually a thing, but it's something I used to fear as a child. Um, and I always thought, well, I, I, not, not in case I go deaf here, I can be, I'd be able to use it, but I thought because it's, my ears are such an important part of my life, I could understand how difficult it would be for people who don't have the use of their ears to get on in the world that we live in, which is geared towards people who do. Um, so I felt I wanted to learn sign language so I could communicate with, with people. When I worked in theatres, I thought how amazing to have uh, someone with no hearing at all come to the box office where I might be working um, and for me to be able to completely turn to sign language to conduct the transaction in. That would have given me so much joy to have been able to accommodate them in my world. Their world too, you know what I mean? You know me, it's all about equality, clearly. It's on every level and that, that goes for lots of different types of diversity as well. And that's it. Uh, there we are with the podcast questions. Phew, what a bumper batch. And thank you so much. If you have any more questions, head over to the thread and pop them in there. Please don't chat in the thread. Um, makes my life easier. I've said that before already. Uh, but I do love hearing from you. And I really, really appreciate you taking the time to ask questions. And what a varied bunch they are. Now, going back to uh, the other question from Mrs. Comet Hunter. She wanted to know if I had any uh, photographs of the Genesis shawl in its entirety. Well, I can do better than that. I've decided to dig it out of the archives so that I can show it to you again. Um, this is the, the shawl that I, was, I wear to all my yarn shows and festivals every time I go. I'll be wearing it this weekend because it's the Nottingham Yarn Expo. Um, it's enormous and it is, of course, double knitting. This shawl has yet to be written up. Please don't badger me about it anymore. I feel so guilty about it. I mean, I don't mind. If you do badger me, you're going to badger me anyway. Um, it, it will hopefully spur me on to writing up the pattern properly. It hasn't been done so far, but that's because it's enormous. Not the shawl. The shawl's big enough on its own. The pattern is enormous. It includes lots of different techniques, hundreds of different types of increases and decreases, and bobbles and cables and lace work, two different types of yarn overs, the cast on itself. The, 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 it's a bit of a thesis. You've heard me talk about this before if you're a regular watcher. However... I do want to show it to you, because here it is. This is what I call the green side, and this is what I call the red side. It is, of course, double knitting, um, and there's, there's lots of stuff to it. I probably need to go behind the sofa to show it to you properly. Here we are. Uh, can you still hear me? So there's enormous amounts of it. It goes on for absolutely forever. It took 
probably about four and a half, maybe five months. It's a triangular, top-down triangular shawl construction. Um, it's absolutely lovely to, to wrap myself around. I don't tend to wear it wrapped like a blanket like that. I'll, I'll wear it kind of gathered up over my neck, often like this, or even just over one shoulder. Um, and I can, I can wear it as a, a massive, great big scarf, and I really, really do love it. But I'll take you, for those of you who are interested, on a little tour through it. It starts, um, which side am I on? Yeah, it starts up here with a little, like a version of a garter tab start for a shawl. Can't be called a garter tab because there's no garter stitch, it's a stocking stitch on both sides. But, uh, so I call it a centre tab shawl and uh, it starts there and then works its way outwards with increases along here, down both sides of the spine and along here in very much a traditional way. Um, then you've got some ordinary colour work here. This is just a salt and pepper colour, um, which looks kind of brown. But if you see it is um, one of green and one of red and one of green and one of red, because red and green make brown. <laughs> and your eye is doing that for you here. But it's actually the same colours as I've used elsewhere. Then there's a line of uh, little eyelets. Now these eyelets are created by doing what I call connected yarn over. So these don't, these don't make holes in the fabric. They make holes in one side of the fabric turn it over, there are actually holes in the other side of the fabric, but you can't find a hole all the way through because then the two sides of the fabric are locked together in a certain way. Um, so they are, they act like this little stained glass window effect where you can see the color of the fabric behind, which I think is really effective and really kind of, kind of cool. Then I've got these bobbles. Now these bobbles are on a contrasting color background and obviously each bobble is paired with a bobble on the other side of the other color. Then I've got more eyelets. Then I've got another design, which is just standard two color work. More eyelets, but you can see how uh, using them together like this, you get this wonderful honeycombing texture, which I absolutely love. It's just gorgeous. Again, these are all locked together, so you can't see holes all through the fabric. More color work, more bobbles. More eyelets, more uh, connected yarn overs used to, to do this, but this is using uh, zigzagging lines of increases and decreases to create these, these stripy textures, the zigzagging texture. Then I've got actual texture here. We've got um, some reverse stocking stitch panels and some normal stocking stitch panels showing through, which of course on the back are reversed and look like that. More two color color work. And this colour work is a design which is based on the cathedral floor at Amiens. There's a there's, they've got black and white tiles on lots of different designs, but this one I particularly liked, and I rendered that in there. Amiens in northern, northern France, of course. Then, more bubbles, then we get to this section. Now, this section is very interesting. It's the same overall pattern as this earlier panel here, but there's a big, two big differences. One, I've worked all of the decreases with the contrast colour rather than with the background colour, and it looks entirely different. It's very, very striking. Two, these are unconnected yarn overs. As you can see, you can see all the way through the fabric. Now, if I were to hold up the other panel, you can't. I mean, you can, you can, you can see kind of, you can always see through knitting, but there's, there's no actual holes there, whereas here, actual holes all the way through the fabric. The holes line up, which they don't with the other one. So very, very different ways of working something. The actual stitch pattern looks exactly the same here and here, but by using the different types of yarn over and the different colors of decreases, totally different effect. More texture work here, this little checkerboard pattern with uh, knits and pearls. This uh, section here is the shepherd's plaid pattern from the um, uh, from the Sanka gloves, I wanted to add that. And then it finishes with these, which are cables. They're a one over one cable on... Now the joy of being able to do uh, cables in two colours like this is you don't have to put it on a pearl bed because it, it still pops. Usually you'd put cables on a pearl bed so the cables would show up. I've got two colours, don't need to worry about that. You could if you wanted to, you don't have to. And then the whole thing is finished with the longest kitchen of graft in the world. So that is the Genesis shawl. It will hopefully be ready to show very, very soon. Um, in terms of releasing the pattern, it's probably not going to be this year. I did say I wanted it by the end of this year. I think it's unlikely, but hopefully in the new year you'll get a chance to be able to 
to knit your very own. I hope, Mrs Comet Hunter, that that answers your question. I'm now going to talk about tomorrow, which is very, very exciting. I'm going to the Nottingham Yarn Expo. I can't wait. It's going to be, it's going to be absolutely brilliant. Uh, I'm teaching on Saturday, but I'm going up tomorrow afternoon um, because my class is at nine o'clock on Saturday morning. I'm not usually much good to anybody at nine o'clock in the morning, so I can only apologise to anybody who's in my class. If I'm not my usual bouncy self, I, I will be, don't worry, I'll make sure of it, but um, I might just have to work a little bit harder at it. <laughs> I'm doing the demystifying de double knitting class, which I, I do as of course, my standard class now, which is making sure that there are more double knitters in the world who can spread the gospel of DK to all and sundry, which is my plan. And I'm really looking forward to it. I don't know what to expect. It's the first one, of course, so uh, I'm sure no one else really knows what to expect either. I've been looking through the list of vendors and it's very extensive. There's lots of people there that I know already and I'm really looking forward to seeing various people um, that I won't have seen since whenever the last one was. Perth, probably. Perth, good Lord. Um, so that's gonna be really, really fun. I'm also, uh, I'm going, I'm going up tomorrow with uh, John Dunballam uh, of Easy Knits fame, and you all know John's John's fantastic yarns, which I don't currently have any. Well, I've got some over there, but I can't be bothered to grab it. Um, you know his wonderful, rich, saturated colours. Um, he's exhibiting there, and we weren't planning to go up together, but he uh, has been let down at the last minute by ill health of uh, the person who was going to be spending uh, the weekend with him and helping him set everything up. So I said, well, I'm going to be there as well. I, I, so I was, I was going to be going up on the train a bit later in the afternoon. I'm now going up a little bit earlier so that I can... so I can just help him fetch and carry and I just be his grunt boy. I can, you know, basically I'm going to be easy in its bitch this, this weekend, <laughs> certainly tomorrow, helping him set up so he's not on his own because he's got a lot of stock to fetch and carry and racks of hooks and pegs and things. And I didn't want to think of him doing that on his own while I just sat on a train thinking I could be helping. So uh, actually, it means we're going to spend a good block of time together and I'm really looking forward to it because John and I always get on very, very well. And then there's the class on Saturday. And then I've got the afternoon free. And I know there's going to be a few people uh, up there that I will know. It'll be lovely to see them on a personal level. So I'll have a wander around the, the stalls themselves, but seeing people as well. Because as I discovered really at Rhinebeck, yarn shows for me are people shows more than yarn shows. And I really love the, the family community aspect of them. And I can't wait for it. Um, I've been in talks with lots and lots of different people. It's been a very busy admin week about teaching at various places, not only in this country, but uh, around other places in Europe as well. Um, some of which are confirmed, but not revealed yet, so I can't talk about them, and some which are not confirmed yet. So lots of irons in lots of fires. 2018 is looking like it's going to shape up to be a pretty busy nitty time for me, which is just fabulous, and I can't wait for it all to begin. Um, so let's move on, shall we, from all of that. I'm not going to do a grammar rant or uh, a what's tap, because I've actually not got a great deal of knitting content to talk about. Sorry about that. That's why I was happy to, to resurrect Genesis and chat about that today. Because some of you will know that I've had a very, very complicated sock pattern on the go recently, which is for a magazine commission. And I've not been able to show it or talk about it in definite terms, only in vagaries. So it's been, it's been a nightmare. It's been an absolute nightmare. I was a couple of weeks late for my deadline because the maths of this damn sock were keeping me awake at night. I'm glad to say uh, it's finished and it's sent off and it's been received by the publishers and they, they love the look of it. And it's, it's, it's a sock I'm really, really pleased with, but boy, oh boy, has it bullied me. Probably more so than any other pattern I've tried to put together. Um, It'll make more sense when you see it. What I've done, even though I've sent the samples off and I'll probably never see them again, um, I have, I've filmed an excerpt for whatever podcast happens after they've been released in the magazine. So, um, so I'll insert that and you'll be able to see exactly what I'm talking about. But it's just, they're very unusual construction. 
there's lots and lots of crazy aspects to the construction, which of course is my own fault, but it's not really. I came across a photograph of um, some subject matter that I wanted to represent in the socks, and there was only one real way of doing it, and in order to work out how to do that, I needed to approach the sock from a couple of different directions. So I, I had to think long and hard about how to make it happen in the first place, and when I'd fixed on the idea, getting the maths of making that work for me made my brain hurt a little bit. <laughs> now, I, I'm usually kind of good with the numbers and I'm very good with the, the sort of spatial awareness aspect of it, but there's something about these socks that just spanked my little behind in a way that I've never come across with a knitting pattern before. And I had so many false starts and so many... The problem is it was taking so long to get to the point where I realised a certain thing wasn't working. So, that makes, you know, with knitting, obviously, it doesn't happen overnight. And particularly with socks, it's a small gauge. You've got to knit a lot of it before you can realise if it's actually going to, to make sense or not. And time after time, I was like, I'm not happy with that. And if it were just for me, if it's something I was making for myself, I'd been okay with it. I thought, this is for publication, this has got to be good, it's got to be better than good, it's got to be right, it's got to be perfect. So rip it back, start again, rip it back, start again, rip it back, start again. Try again, try again, try again. Frustrated sounds, throwing it across the room, screaming in frustration. <laughs> Poor Ben, had a lot to contend with while I was knitting those socks. However, it's done. I've now moved on to another pattern which is part of the same set of the same magazine. I'm doing three different patterns, all thematically linked. It's very exciting. It's a big, big commission. Delighted to be doing it. The pressure's on because, obviously, if I was late with that first one, which I was, like two weeks late, it means that my deadline for the second one is two weeks shorter. So I've been frantically knitting that. and. What do you know? There are some techniques in it that haven't been done before and some things that I've had to try and engineer and work out on my own how to make happen. So I've done it to myself again. Uh, it's a much, much more simple sock and it looks much more simple. Um, there's a, and it's actually very simple to do. It's the doing of it's not hard. Like the other sock, the other sock's not hard to knit. It was just hard to work out. This is very simple to do and it looks very simple as well. Um, it's very effective and I'm really, really happy with it. It's using different types of uh, fabric textures, um, some that might be a little bit of a surprise to some people, which is what I'm hoping for, so some hoping it's something unusual. I'm very happy with it, however, it's my major whip of the moment, and I can't show it to you. So, um, I can't talk about that, <laughs> he said having spoken about it for the last five minutes. So I do want to share with you what I have got on the needles that I can share with you. Um, I am so delighted. There's a little bit more of this sock here, which is uh, the Mon Sheep Shop, uh, the self-striping yarn in the colourway Scotland. This is part of the Six Nations rugby uh, colourway. And it's absolutely beautiful. I do so, so love it. It's hard to tell, it's only three colours. It's purple, blue and green, the colours of the Scottish Highlands. It kind of almost looks like, you know, some of those colourways that, that sort of spiral in a certain way that they're variegated and they, they make it look like they're slightly self-striping. This actually is self-striping. You get um, about three stripes of each colour. You can see there, it's all, all one colour. All one colour until... Well, clearly just about to start new until there, that's where it changes from blue to green. Um, so you get about three rounds of each colour, and it's so lovely. What I'm doing, I'm using my blipless stripes technique here, so you can see there in the pearl ditch, it's a two by one rib sock, ribbed sock. All the way through, you can see nice clean lines with no pearl bump blips showing through, and that's because all the blips are on the inside, and that's the joy of doing blipless stripes. It sends all the, they're not blipless, they're blipless on the outside, it sends all the blips to the inside, which is great and is exactly what you want to see so you get perfect clean stripes. If you want to know a little bit about uh, how that works, then all of that is entirely discussed in my pattern, the best self-striping ribbed socks in the world, which is available on Ravelry as well. So uh, there's lots of tips and tricks. I'm doing this sock like the, the whole pattern of the self-striping ribbed socks, but you could just take and say, well, I just want to, I want to do a normal sock, but I just want to do blip to stripes. Well, there's lots of things in there. So even if you're making socks that are not 
ribbed, you could do this on the cuff. If you're making socks that are not self-striping at all, there's loads of other techniques in there to uh, allow you to, um, to use them. <laughs> got things going on there's other things happening off screen there um putting me off and um, so you could use all a lot of the techniques in it on your ordinary socks as well there's lots and lots of tips and tricks all the way through the makings of a sock to make it worthwhile um and if you look at the comments i'm really pleased with this i don't normally say this kind of thing but if you look at the comments on ravelry on that pattern page the things people are saying about the pattern have really, really gladdened my heart. I wanted people to realise that there's a lot of useful things that they can learn. Um, and I wanted to share with people the things that I've learned about what I've, dis what I've discovered about making socks myself. Um, I ain't the sock petition for nothing. I, I do, even though I don't tend to do as many sock patterns as I used to, apart from currently, um, my heart is still in, in, in my socky past and this is part of that. So there's, there's definitely more length going on there. I haven't touched it for a little while, but I'm just glad to own it because, you know, I thought I'd lost it. I couldn't find the project bag it was in, and it's in one of my fantastic Midwinter Yarns um, vintage project bags from Estelle, who does some, some wonderful, wonderful things. Isn't that gorgeous? Look at those flowers, those colors, amazing. Beautiful, beautiful thing. Um, and I, I found it. It was buried under a pile of clothes somewhere, but I genuinely thought I might have taken it somewhere and left it, which would have been devastating from the yarn point of view, the sock point of view, and the bag point of view. So I'm very, very glad indeed to have it back in my possession. The other thing that I uh, want to share with you is progress on my sort of sideways slanting scarf. Uh, slightly on the bias, um, although not not really. The edges are not on the bias. The centre patch is on the bias, but that that seems to sort of be slanting the the whole thing a little bit. Um, we'll see how that works in the block. I may block it a little bit more square. I may not. I may just let it be the shape it wants to be. This is what it looks like on both sides. Um, <coughs> pardon me. It's a very, very simple pattern. It is genuinely so simple that I haven't yet written any of it out. Um, I don't need to follow any pattern. I just sort of look from what I've done so far and I know where I need to go. It's done with increases and decreases in every row, every other row really, to, uh, to, to send columns of stitches off in different directions. So this column of stitches you can see here, comes up here and then decides to skew themselves off that way. It's it's, dare I say it, I'm not, I'm not allowed to use words like this about my own work, it's ingenious because it's so simple. Um, very, very simple to do, really, really effective. And this is knit, uh, you'll remember, with the Erica Knight uh, British Blue, I think it's called, or Best of British Blue, what's it called? British Blue, Erica Knight, uh, handmade in England, it's 100% um, blue face Leicester wool. It's 220 metres, it's DK weight for 100 grams. It's absolutely lovely you can see it's got this it's got a lovely bloom to it already so it's going to halo really nicely um halo hopefully rather than pill that's my plan for it but it's it's just it feels so squishy and soft and it's going to be the warmest most comfortable scarf i have a horrible feeling that it might it might get more love for a certain certainly for a while than all of my scarves put together um, this Christmas and winter period. I may end up just wearing this because it's just gorgeous. Very quick to knit. I haven't had a great deal of time on it, but you can see it's a lot longer than it was last time you saw it. Um, and I genuinely can't get enough of it. It's the it's the project I want to knit. Um, when I'm sitting there thinking, oh, this is bad in maths, it's hurting my head, um, I sit there thinking, I really, really want to knit this. Now, I'm, it's going a little bit more slowly than it was recently because I have started, um, just as an experiment, I'm changing my knitting style. I'm an English style knitter normally, as we know, but for double knitting, I have a yarn in my left hand and a yarn in my right, and I'm not changing that. But what I am changing is how I'm actually creating the stitches. I have started, just to see if it works well, wrapping my purl stitches the other way. Which means that when, they, when I turn the work over and they come to me as a knit stitch, I have to knit the knits through the back loop to untwist the stitch so it doesn't get, become a twisted stitch. And then the purl stitch of the pair, I wrap clockwise around my needle rather than anti-clockwise. 
Now, that's in an effort to see if I can even up the tension between my knits and pearls. And I, I think it's working. This is where I started. I mean, there's definitely a line across there. But I think I might be getting a little bit sloppy again. Maybe I was just paying more attention to it there and maybe it's not the technique at all. So it makes me a combination knitter on this project only. But I don't know... I don't know whether I want to continue with it or whether I want to go back to my normal style. It's not as... Uh, it's not as fast as... as I am with my, my normal way of knitting. And... Uh, I, I'd like to just sort of sit back and relax on this one, but I thought because there are large sections of one colour with no colour changes, that any discrepancies in tension were going to be more visible. So I thought, well, now would be a good opportunity to have a little practice and see if I could do it. And I could do it quite easily, it's not a problem, um, but I don't know if it's actually making enough of a difference to make me want to do the whole thing. We shall see. I'm just going to knit one more. Uh, pair here so I can just lock those yarn overs in place because I have just done a decrease, uh, an increase with the yarn overs there, I don't want to lose them. So that's how this is going. I, I mean, I love it. Whichever way I choose to continue knitting it, I don't, I don't know that that will become my default. I'm doing some stocking stitch flat at the moment, admittedly on sock yarn needles, with sock yarn and on uh, 2.25 millimetre needles. So. The, the gauge is going to be tighter anyway, but I'm going flat and it's stocking stitch. And it kind of looks like my stocking stitch in the round does. It doesn't look like I've, um, it doesn't look like I'm rowing out at all. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. With this yarn and these needles, I, I'm not, but, so that's interesting. But I, I just wonder if there might be times in my knitting where I, I look at it and go, it's got ridges on it. I think I'll, I'll knit this combination. Does everyone realise that if you, where you, the normal way of wrapping a, a, a stitch, the yarn goes around the needle, around the needle tip in an anti-clockwise direction. That gives you a stitch mounted on the needle on the next row, where the right leg, as you look at it, the right leg is on the front of the needle and the left leg sits behind. If you were to wrap your needle, wrap the yarn around your needle clockwise, people say that twists the stitch, it doesn't it remounts the stitch. So instead of being the right leg in front, it would be like that, with the right, with the left leg, what is the left leg as you look at it in front, and the right leg behind the needle. That's what that means, it would look like that. If you were just to knit it through the, the front leg as normal, that would twist the stitch. So you would have to knit it through the back loop in order not to end up with a twisted stitch. So wrapping your yarn around the needle does not result in a twisted stitch. It's how you treat that stitch on the next row. So you could wrap it anti-clockwise and then knit through the back loop and that would give you a twisted stitch. It's the knitting of it that twists the stitch or not, not how it's wrapped because how it's mounted is either one way or the other and how you knit into it will give you, in, in either case, will give you a twisted stitch or a non-twisted stitch. So that's something, it's a little misconception. People think that wrapping your yarn a certain way will twist a stitch. Knitting your stitch a certain way will twist the stitch or not. Don't say you haven't been told. <laughs> you come here for the gossip, but you know, there's, you, you get the tips along the way as well. That's, that's, that's what I want to do. Um, so I'm delighted with how that is coming along in terms of the scarf. Whether or not I will uh, continue to be a combination knitter, I don't know. I don't really like knitting stitches through the back loop. Um, as a matter of course, I, li I like how a, a stitch feels. I'm so familiar with how it feels, I can knit into it in the front loop normally without looking at it, and I can knit watching the television, and I love that. I have to pay a bit more attention when I'm wrapping the other way and knitting through the back loop. We shall see. The jury's out. It's an interesting experiment. Um, I'm, enjoying, I'm enjoying it from a scientific point of view, anyway. Uh, and the last thing I want to talk about, I don't have any other whips. It's the other pattern that I can't talk about, and various older things. There's so many things in my head at the moment. I want to just like knit stuff, and I can't knit things quickly enough because I haven't got the time. Um, but I want to talk about this. You've seen this before. This is the disclosure pattern. This, this disclosure cowl. 
Uh, it has now been released and is available on Ravelry. It's just £4. Um, it's a very, very simple cowl. It will take you no time at all to knit up. So if you actually, um, if you're looking for another Christmas gift idea for guys, you could make one of these with or without the beads. It's up to you. But I think the beads give it a certain flair. I'm not going to lie. These beads have turned into uh, quite a contentious issue, it would appear, online. Um, so much so that I've considered renaming the pattern Marmite rather than Disclosure. It seems that the beads are quite controversial. Uh, some people absolutely love them. And people are saying, why have I never thought to use big chunky beads in my knitting like that? It's so effective. Oh my goodness, it's, it's living art. I mean, I've had a variety of really vociferous um, positive comments. But I've also had people say, oh, I don't like that. Oh, God, that's disgusting. It looks like something awful. Um, and it's really interesting because I thought this was a very simple, innocuous cowl that just sits around my neck like that. I love wearing it. I absolutely adore it. I love the beads. I love the texture. I love the fact that they've been arranged in this sort of diamond pattern that gives them like an argyle feel. That was, that was the plan. It wanted to look like beaded argyle. I love the fact that they're all different. I love the fact that they're chunky. I love everything about it. I love the fact that it's quite unusual. But I thought it was simple. Some people have really taken against it and they've seen fit to let me know. Um, now Ben and I have been chatting about this and he says I should just let it all go. And he's right. I absolutely should. But it's never nice when people say unpleasant things about stuff that you've done online, either to your face or sort of obliquely sort of referencing on, on a post. And I just think we can all choose not to say something unpleasant. We can all have an opinion. And of course, everyone's entitled to their opinion. I'm not saying that they're not. But my opinion is that if you haven't got anything nice to say, keep it to yourself. Ben says I should be pleased that I'm dividing people because it's getting people talking about it and that uh, things of a divisive nature are very, very useful. Great. But I also think that I do this for a living now and every negative comment that somebody reads could put, could put them off buying. Not, not this, but anything else. You know, if you read something negative about a pattern and you, you might start to look at it in a different way or associate it with that negative comment. And if you were planning to buy it and that negative comment has put you off, then that designer doesn't get that payment. And this is what I do for a living now. So it's, it's kind of important to me that, um, that, that people like what I do. Not everyone's gonna like what I do, I get that. Um, if you want an example of someone who really bangs his own drum, look at Stephen West. He's, he's out there, he's, he's outrageous in his looks and, and I'm, I know he got a lot of flack for it. Well, do you know what, that's gonna hurt. Um, I don't get anything like that, and this is a very, very minor example of that, but it's never nice to read some, that somebody doesn't like what you've done, um, particularly if it can have a financial ramification as well. So I just wanted to draw your attention to this cowl and say that it is available, and regardless of how contentious or controversial it may be, I absolutely bloody love it. <laughs> <laughs> I love wearing it. It's knitted from the same Quince and Co yarn as these two hats. In fact, it's the three colours from these two hats. So this one had some left over, and this is the, the pale grey there. This had some left over, and that's the darker grey. And the green, I'd only used here and here, had loads left over, so it's made up the, uh, the, the main body of the cowl. And I love wearing these together because being made from the same yarns, they just work so well together. They really tie in very nicely together. Um, I can wear that one with it, and obviously I can wear this one too, and it, and it works just as well because it's all the same yarns. Coordinated yarny wardrobe, isn't that the goal? Katie Lavelli, you know what I'm talking about. Isn't that exactly the plan? So, so that uh, is the hat, and this is the cowl. It is... I have to say, contentiousness aside, the perfect Christmas knit gift. Particularly if you've knitted a hat and you've got some scraps of chunky left over, you don't need to use the same striping sequence that I've used, for example. You could go wild and have single stripes of any scraps of chunky weight yarn you've got. I knitted this with a 5.5 millimeter needle um, and the beads came as one bag 
There's 48 that make up this cowl. It's a 16 stitch repeat, so you could make it 16 stitches wider or 32 or 48 or, or, uh, or shorter, depending on your, your taste. But it's, it uses eight, yeah, eight beads per repeat. Um, this, I got about 75 beads in a big bag from Tiger, which cost me a pound. So the cowl was off cuts of yarn that I'd use in other hats and a pound for the beads. It's a pound, a pound for the cowl. It's so, so warm and cozy and it's, it's gonna bloom really nicely. The yarn itself is a single, which I don't usually like working with and I had my issues with it while I was working with it, but the, the texture of the fabric that it has made is wonderful. And I think the beads are really unusual and I think the beads make it what it is. Otherwise, it's just a knitted cowl. I think it's something different. So if you're looking for something a little bit different and you want to know how I made this, then head over to Ravelry and pick up the Disclosure Cowl by Saltpetition. And all the naysayers be damned. <laughs> I really like it. I like it so much. Yeah, sorry, my phone is showing low battery. It just flipped up on screen. I like it so much, I wear it all the time. Sometimes around the house. Because I just like the feel of it around my neck. It's tragic, isn't it? Anyway, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap this up because we're approaching the hour and a half mark now. Um, it's been my absolute pleasure talking to you uh, this, this afternoon. And I cannot wait to get up to Nottingham and see all the joys that that's going to bring. And I cannot wait to see what you've all been up to. So please head over to the general chatter thread on the Sogmetician group uh, on Ravelry and show me what, what you've been doing. Show me your finished objects, show me your whips. Let's, let's make this a two-way thing. So one of the things people used to say to me at Rhinebeck all the time were, um, when they came up to me was, oh, it must be so weird because we know so much about you, you know nothing about us. Well, now's your chance. Do something about that. Share something about yourselves in the general chatter thread and we can all get to know each other a whole heap better. And I look forward to that as well. I also look forward to seeing you next time. So while this podcast episode definitely is an FO, remember life is a work in progress. Just take it one stitch at a time. See you next time. Bye-bye.